please, while, you know, the questions or whatever, try and sit still and do the meditation and keep focused because the people are moving, it, it really disrupts the class. If you're fidgeting, moving, looking around. Does anyone have a question? Hi, Stuart. Yes, Matt. So in his teaching work with you and um, your contemporaries with him, did Rudy speak a lot about Nityananda and Muktananda? Did he, for example, quote them a lot or share a lot about experiences with them as life lessons, that kind of thing? Yes, <laughs> yes, all the time. I mean, look, he told me, I don't know how many times, the story of how he met Nichananda, how powerful Nichananda was, how literally one meeting with Nichananda completely transformed his life. And then Nichananda became his root guru, you know, and he went back a year later or six months later and Nichananda had taken his samadhi and he never met him again. But the meeting was so powerful that it completely transformed. I won't go into all the extraneous details, but it completely transformed his life, changed everything for him. And to tell you the truth, you know, look, the day I met Rudy, it's a true story. You know, um, I walked into his gallery and I was attracted to him like a magnet to a piece of, you know, iron you know i mean it went boom right to him and started talking to me about his teachings about his teachers in india he showed me a photograph which i god knows where that photograph is today of himself lying on the floor at a foot of a teacher and with a picture of nichananda superimposed in his heart and this is the first thing rudy ever showed me and it was, you know, to me, a, a very powerful experience to have just met this person and to being introduced to not only him, but his lineage. So he talked a lot about Nityananda in glowing, wondrous terms uh, as a remarkable teacher, as a, not even a teacher, but like an avatar, you know, somebody who was just born you know, to serve God. And, uh, you know, and Nichananda through Rudy became such an integral part of my spiritual practice that to this day, I invoke him in my meditations and my daily life because, you know, his energy, his purity, his wisdom was so profound and his willingness to give it was so profound. And I've been to Ganesh Puri, you know, where he lived uh, many times, and, you know, and it's so interesting because they have a big marble temple there built for him. But I went into that temple and I couldn't feel his energy. And there were soldiers walking around with rifles. And I mean, it was tourists taking pictures. So I walked around the temple and found and discovered a place that was his house where he lived and there was nobody there. And the energy was so powerful in that place that it truly, you know, opened areas of myself that I never dreamed I could open. It was so powerful. So every time I went back to Ganesh Puri, that's where I went. I never went to that big marble temple. I would just go to that house and I would sit in front of the chair he sat in and I would do deep meditations for an hour or maybe more and open to the Shakti, the energy, the ancient Shakti, the ancient energy that was transmitted in that place. Through Rudy, I met Nichananda and Nichananda has served me just about, you know, from the day I met Rudy, Till today, and even before, you know, I didn't know it, but I'm sure he guided me to Rudy. As far as Muktananda, Matt, I don't want to get into it, okay? I really don't, because that's a whole other story, and I just don't really want to talk about it. What went on, what happened, the kind of energy, the 
teachings that went on. And I, you know, it's just something I don't want to talk about, really. Um, uh, forgive me, but I'm in no position to talk about that or discuss what took place between Rudy and, and Muktananda. The whole of the story, the whole of the chapter in a novel, <laughs> it really is. And, and I can only tell you this because he was there and I saw it in my own eyes. You know, what went on and I, and it's just something I can't talk about. So please forgive me. Uh, I, it's just, I don't want to talk about that. Does anyone else have a question they would like to ask? I have a question, as Jason. Um, could you elaborate on uh, when you I have to speak the... up. Or you have to speak up. Yeah. Um, could you elaborate on the uh, union of the male and female principles? On male and female energy? Yeah. Yeah. You've talked about the, the union that takes place. Yeah, well, it's a very important marriage of energies that takes place inside a human being. And, you know, I always tell people, look, tantric yoga is one of the most important elements of inner work that a person has to learn. And we always, you know, associate it with, you know, sex and eroticism and stuff like that. Because every book you ever pick up on tantra, all it has is gods and gurus and, you know, uh, Mahasiddhas coupling with their mates. And, I, and yes, this is an important part of it. But in a deeper sense, the sexual energy is the energy that will activate Kundalini. And the sexual energy, when the male-female principle unify in the sexual area, you know, through a conscious effort that we have to make to draw energy through the sexual chakra, you know, that marriage will give birth to Kundalini. And Kundalini is the, you know, pathway to God, to enlightenment. So the male-female principle, you know, and this doesn't matter if you're gay or straight or bi or A, B, C, D, E, F, G, you know, it really doesn't matter because that male-female principle will unify in anyone who learns how to get balanced inside themselves, opening the chakra below the navel, getting the heart open, getting the mind quiet, receiving knowledge from the universe, and drawing the human level through the sec as, as Shakti through the sexual area to the base of the spine. That's how the male female principle unifies, because it has to be a conscious activity. It can't be some promiscuous activity. It's got to be through consciousness and through the evolution of consciousness in oneself. You know, and what does that mean? It means the full development of a chakra system that brings that kind of consciousness. And then the yin yang, you know, Shiva Shakti, Yehovah Shakina. I mean, in every religion, there's the male female principle. Every religion has it, you know, God and the Virgin Mary, you know, I mean, uh, you know, I mean, it's amazing how it's in every single religion, that union that gives birth, you know, in Christianity is the Messiah, which in kind of Kundalini is like the Messiah, pathway to enlightenment. But this is an outgrowth of doing very profound inner work. And it comes, you understand? You, I, you can read about this. I mean, I look, I have books where I write about this. I mean, there's a book I wrote called The Mystical Fairy Book. There's a whole chapter on this. Union of male, female, uh, you know, and that whole thing. And, but you can read about it you know, yes, okay, maybe this is part, then you got to do the work on yourself to build a system that it becomes experiential. It's not a, 
you know, something that you have in your brain and then you can't figure out how to do it and you make yourself crazy. But as the chakra system refines and evolves, these things, mudra becomes possible. Understand uh, all, everything, everything that has to do with higher energy and even mysticism, that all becomes possible as the chakra system evolves. And one of the most important things is the bringing of the energy through the sexual area, because that really is the human becoming the divine. And it's all a process. Rudy always called it a process of inner unfoldment, of inner development. Step by step, these things begin to manifest inside you. Not as intellectual knowledge, but as living experience. And it's what I'm trying to do through these classes, you know, to help people that attend them to build systems inside to where they truly can experience this kind of stuff and use it to get closer to God, closer to their enlightenment. You know, not use it to entrap other people because there's a lot of power involved. You know, not use it in a, in a negative way, but in a completely positive inner sense that it brings about spiritual enlightenment. You know, I once said to Rudy, he was talking about the power of his of inner work. I said, well, Rudy, with this kind of power, it would be easy to become a dictator. And he just looked at me and he said, what a bore. <laughs> what a bore. You know, and he's right. It's freedom or being enslaved. Freedom is the activation of Kundalini, you know, and the pathway to spiritual enlightenment. That's freedom. You know, being a dictator over people, I mean, it's control, it's power, it's just dumb, you know? I hope that's clear, you know, I mean, it's a very good subject and it's a subject that brings up a lot of profound, you know, lessons for all of us, you know. Does anyone else have a question they would like to ask? Uh, yes, giving this time, Jasper. Of, you know, you're, you're uh, coming you like static on a radio. You can't yeah. hear me. Maybe my, I hear you, but it's like static. Oh, can you talk about giving and receiving? Yeah. Well, you know, also a very important subject because in life, everything is about giving and receiving. You go to the grocery store, you give money, you get food. You understand every interaction with every human being, we give words, we give conversation, we receive words. You know, everything is about giving and receiving. And the whole purpose of that is to learn how to give and receive unconditionally. How to give somebody something and it comes not from the head and not from what you want to buy them with something, but it comes out of the heart. And it comes with love and it comes with compassion. It comes with happiness and it nurtures other people. And when people develop the heart chakra through inner work, I mean, their interactions with other people are that way. You know, they're capable of giving and the gift comes, you know, you can always tell when somebody cooks a meal, whether it's a pain in the ass or they did it with love. By just the taste of the food. You can always tell when somebody brings you a gift, are they trying to buy something from you or, you know, sell you, or it really comes from their heart and it's a real gift.
I mean, you know, Michael here, he's in Stanford. He's been coming to my classes. He came today with a bag of food and, and I could see it coming right out of his heart. The love that went into buying that food to give to myself so that I could have something to eat. And I had the soup and it tasted great. <laughs> So that's giving and receiving, you understand? And you've got to be, have nobility of soul to give unconditionally. You have to be happy and full of love inside yourself. I, I, you know, I, I remember once I was standing in Rudy's store. I'll never forget this. I've told this story, so bear with me again. Some of you might not have heard it. I was standing in his store and somebody, a woman came in with this huge bouquet of flowers. What's the cost for then $800, which was a lot of money back in the early 70s, you know? And, uh, and she gave it to him and he gave it back to her and refused the gift. And he told her, he told her, you can't buy a spiritual life. You can't buy you know, uh, something from me. And I, I won't get into exactly what it was. It had to do with a boyfriend she had and, you know, and he gave it back to her and he told her, please, I don't want this gift. You know, 10 minutes later, a young man walked in with a bag of M&Ms, <laughs> bag of M&Ms, and he gave it to Rudy. And it, you could feel the love in that young guy that he, when he gave this to Rudy, and Rudy hugged him and he kissed him and he, it was unbelievable, you know? And he started giving M&Ms to everybody in the room. <laughs> you know, it was like joy, you know, pure joy that, you know, that was expressed in that gift. Because the gift came out of his heart. It was sheer gratitude for everything Rudy had done for his life. And when you give gifts like that, the return is always a hundredfold, always. So that's giving and receiving, you know? And then you have to have the consciousness to recognize what people are giving you, what their real needs are, what their wants are. are they trying to buy you or are they trying to you know, bribe you? Are they trying, you know, are they really giving from the heart? Unconditionally. I remember I, I when I lived in Morocco, when I went back to, uh, I went back to Paris from Morocco to Spain, I bought, just before I left, this beautiful orange, burnt orange uh, brunous that I used to wear in Marrakesh, but I, you know, and I loved it. It was a wonderful cape, and I used to really like it. And I remember giving it to Rudy. And I said, Rudy, I have a present I would like to give you. And I gave it to him. And then maybe about eight months later, I was walking in the halls of Big Indian. And a friend of mine comes running up to me. Stuart, look what Rudy just gave me. <laughs> it's <was> Bruce. <laughs> you know? And I, I started to laugh. I said, okay, Stuart, you can't be attached to that produce. You know, Rudy can do whatever he wants with it. If he wanted to tear it up and cut it up and throw it in the garbage, it, it doesn't belong to you anymore. And again, it was an amazing lesson for me. When he came up, it was a friend of mine. Look what Rudy just gave me. <laughs> it was that orange produce that I bought in Marrakesh. So about a week before I left. <laughs> so giving and receiving has to do with real surrender, letting go, not buying somebody with your gift, not possessing them because you gave them something, and not even expecting anything in return. That's up to them whether they can give, you know, or not. And when the heart is open, it's not difficult to give. When that chakra is really in bloom, 
You want to give. You want to nurture people. I mean, look, honestly, it's why I do these classes. It's giving away everything I've learned in my life. That's the purpose of these classes. Does anyone else have a question? Okay, well, thank you for those very, very wonderful questions. You really brought a lot up. Okay, there'll be a meditation on Sunday. I'm happy to say there are people coming here almost every day for in-person classes. Wherever you live, you're all invited to come. I mean, I probably will have no more than five people at a time. <laughs> so better check with me on the days and when you wanna come because I, I won't be able to fit them in my living room, you know, where I do these classes. But it's very wonderful to have people here doing in-person hands-on healing work in every class. And, uh, you know, again, it's my job to give it away, to help train people so that hopefully they can build a system inside where they can do something similar not through ego and self-importance and who they are as a guru and a swami and you know all that crap that just makes everybody crazy. But unconditionally, unconditionally, with love. Okay, if there are no more questions, God bless you all, thank you. And I'm looking forward to seeing you on Sunday. And have a good weekend. Good evening and bless you. God bless you. Thank you, Stuart. Thank you, Stuart. Welcome. Thank you. Stuart. Thank you. Oh, see you Sunday.